Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. Today we're going to speak about Yemen. And there are more implications and more reasons why we're going to speak about Yemen. One of those reasons was articulated by Reuters yesterday. Yemen's Houthis have waded into the Israel-Hamas war, raging more than 1,000 miles from their seat of power in Sana'a. Part of the axis of resistance backed by Iran, the Houthis have rallied behind the Palestinians since Hamas attacked Israel on October the 7th, opening a new front. Houthi military spokesperson Yahi Sareh said in a statement, The group had launched a large number of ballistic missiles and drones towards Israel, and there would be much more coming to help Palestinians to the victory. And I'm asking, Yemen in the past was in the epicenter or in the, in the center of the conflict. We know about Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Now Yemen fired some ballistic missiles to, towards Israel, the Houthis from Yemen. So I want to clarify what's going on in Yemen. But also, I want to clarify the roots of the conflict in Yemen. Therefore, my guest today, my expert today, is Dr. Tom Walsh. Hello, Tom. Hello. Thanks for having me. Dr. Tom Walsh is a lecturer of international relations and politics, also a Middle East researcher at Northumbria University, associate instructor at London School of Economics and Political Science, award-winning academic conference chair and even organizer. He's also Associate Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Tom is focusing on researching the narrative of war, particularly in the form of sectarian rhetoric on social media in the Middle East, a new Cold War between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So Tom is focusing on narrative, on the visuals, why the war is happening, how the war is happening, and all those aspects of the war. And I'm very happy that uh, Tom accepted the invitation because he's he's expert on Yemen, not only by academic point of view, but also his, it is his personal interest to help to clarify Yemen for the international audience. So the first question is, Tom, can you please elucidate the, the historical roots or causes of the conflict in Yemen? Why there is a conflict in Yemen? Yeah. So thank you for having me once again. Um, it's great to be here. And that's quite right. I think my my primary ambition is to address the gap in knowledge. A lot of people day to day don't even know where Yemen is, um, let alone what's happened there. Um, I think the important thing to say is that the war didn't begin in 2015 when the Saudi-led intervention started. There have been various forms of conflict going on for ve- a very long time. Um, it depends how far back you want to go, but I suppose the best place to start is the Yemen Civil War in 1962. I started in 1962, finished around 1970. Um, just quickly with this one, you had actually Iran and Saudi Arabia backing the same side, um, backing the Zaydi Yemenite in the north. Um, so that's really important for the conversation we'll build later on. Um, but um, yeah, you also... You also had um, President Nasser's Egypt involved supporting the the others. <laughs> so you had a you had a, a, a really absolute kind of um, civil war with outside actors. In fact, people think that it was um, Nasser's involvement in Yemen that ultimately depleted his forces and meant he lost lost out to Israel and others in the end. Um, but that was a big part of militarizing the country. Uh, deepening animosities, um, you know, the, in in 1978, President Saleh takes control of part of Yemen, um, the Republic of Yemen, um, and he ruled for 33 years. Uh, so unification happens in 1990, uh, and Saleh takes control of the whole country, and he compared ruling Yemen to dancing on the heads of snakes. And Victoria Clark's written a book of the same title. And I think what he meant is that there's so much division, so much diversity. Um, you know, Yemen, by all rights, shouldn't be one country. There's just there's so much uh, dispute there. Um, and so in order to rule and dance on the head of snakes, his policies were essentially patrimonialism and divide and rule. That deepened animosities, 
greatly. And the Houthis are, are a group in the sort of northern highland, northwestern highlands of, of Yemen, who were particularly uh, hard pressed and oppressed <laughs> by uh, Saleh. And there were six wars between 2004 and 2010, where Saleh, with the support of the Saudis, actually uh, fought the Houthis, which was deter- was it was destined to. Uh, well, he wanted it to uh, crush them, but it actually emboldened them, militarized them, um, and yeah, that that those are a lot of the historical roots prior to the Arab Spring. And I think I'll leave it there, and we'll just discuss the rest slightly later. And Tom, can you please tell us who lives in Yemen? Because you said it's quite diverse country. So mm-hmm. how can we how can we imagine the population of Yemen? Who are Yemenis? Yeah. Well, when I say diverse, I, I really mean tribally diverse. Um, there, there, are, there are a huge number of different tribes um, and identities that go with that. There's also a lot of different sects. So you have you have Zaydis, which this is one of the unfortunately lazy tropes of some um, international people who, who don't fully understand Yemen. Um, I'm not professing to fully understand it, but I know a bit. Uh, saying that it's a sectarian conflict and that the Zaydis are Shia and so therefore they're just like Iran. They're nominally Shia, but they actually, uh, Zaydism is quite similar to, to Fiverr, um, sort of Sunni Islam. Uh, traditionally, they've prayed in the same mosques, they've intermarried with Sunnis. And so, you know, those are the, that make up a, a part of the population. But you also have um, not many other tribal groups, many other sects throughout the country. Um, so in the south, you've got people who, who still harken back to the separatists sort of movement. They want an independent south. Um, and you've also got, um, you've got an, a, a Salafist and a Wahhabi influence as well in parts of the country. Um, increasingly, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is bigger and growing. Um, so there's a lot of different forces and a lot of different sects, religious groups and political groups, and there's a lot of historical roots to their disputes. Uh, And that's what I mean when I say diverse is that it's not just diversity in terms of lots of different ethnicities. It's like diversity of ideas, identities, and interests. Right. What role do you think uh, foreign intervention has played in both the initiation and perpetuation of the conflict and i'm also interested in which states have been involved and in which way the foreign intervention part has been the key thing that's prolonged this war you know my uh my phd thesis is actually called the iranian saudi rivalry prolonging the war in yemen external actors securitization sectarianism and uh, digital media and so the reason i say prolonged is because it started as a civil war and you know the houthis ended up seizing Sana and essentially conducting a coup uh, where they got rid of the president and instated their own council. Um, but without the Saudi-led coalition invading in 2015, in the March, I think this conflict does not become the huge humanitarian crisis that it is, and it doesn't get prolonged uh, in, and drawn out in quite the way. So the Saudi-led coalition obviously led by Saudi Arabia, but had the support of many Sunni um, and Arab states. Um, it was like the Sunni coalition, it's often called, because all of the states were Sunni, but you had you had actors like um, Sudan in there, for example. Um, my argument has often been that uh, a lot of them j- joined the Saudis to gain favour from the Saudis, rather than because they actually feared Iranian influence in Yemen, which was a stated reason for the conflict. So they've all been involved, <laughs> quite a lot of so, yeah, Arab, uh, and Arab states, but also non-Arab states. Um, and then there have been Western backers as well. So uh, the US being the most important one, I mean, I argue in many places that Saudi Arabia wouldn't have been able to get off the ground without US support. You know, the logistical real support as well as the military support has been humongous. Um, they've never Saudi Arabia never conducted an air campaign before, so um, U.S. support has been essential. 
um, but also uh, the UK. There's a flight, that, there's some great work done by Declassified UK that showed that there were planes leaving the UK every every week to supply Saudi Arabia with weapons. Um, France, Canada, uh, and also to an extent Germany, uh, especially some of their private companies, but sanctioned by the state. Um, on the other hand as well, you have, <laughs> you have um, China and Russia, who've also got strong relations with Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, I'm happy to talk more about those later, but Iran have also been involved. At the beginning, they weren't involved very much. Um, but my argument is, is that over time, they understood that it was a good opportunity to upset the Saudis and to troll them in their own backyard. So they've gradually increased support to where we are today, where I will never call the Houthis an Iranian proxy because I think they have their own agency, but they're very connected and they're very close allies. Some people might ask, uh... Saudi Arabia is a big country with a quite significant military presence. Yeah. And why Saudi Arabia was attacking Yemen? Why they didn't just close the borders and just, you know, just leave it for Yemen to decide about itself? What is what is the geopolitical driving force behind the decision that Saudi Arabia made? Yeah, I think that's the key part. And, you know, geo makes me think geography as well and i think that's a huge part um so saudi arabia is a huge country and it sort of surrounds all parts of yemen to the, to the north and east sort of encloses it um and so you know um ibn saud actually when he when he was dying said keep yemen weak that was one of his things that he said on his last statements um so they've always they've always feared um They've always tried to control Yemen. Now, the main reasons for that is if they've got an enemy on their border, that's a security threat. That's one of the core reasons. But even more important than that is the fact that, obviously, to the west of Saudi Arabia and Yemen is the Red Sea. And at the bottom of that is the Bab al-Mandeb Strait, which is a very small sort of choke point. Uh, prior to the war, 30% of the world's oil and natural gas was passing through that narrow chokehold. You could compare it a bit to the South China Sea um, in that way. Uh, so that's a good frame to understand it. I think a lot of people, more people understand the South China Sea in IR. Um, and I think that, that's the one thing that the Saudis have never mentioned in their discourse as a reason why this war is happening. They said everything else, not uh, well, it's to ensure safe passage of our oil and natural gas. And it also explains a lot why the international community has been so involved um, and so complicit actually, in the war. Some students might ask, uh, and you mentioned Western and non-Western powers, yeah. is there a desire for peace in Yemen? Or is there sort of unofficial rhetoric to keep the conflict going? So um, I've, uh, I've, I, had, I was lucky enough to speak to um, the US, the the ambassador to the UK for Saudi Arabia and that was a couple of years ago 2021 I think and he was very uh, adamant that it was uh, that they wanted to get out really but he said he, he said things before like um the thing about war is you get to decide when to go in but not when to come out which is a bit of a I'm not sure I don't really know what he means by that entirely but I think what he's trying to say is that they've dug themselves into a very unwinnable conflict and they, they don't for a while, it wasn't an exit route. It does look like they're going to find a way out now. Um, so I think there is a desire to get out of the conflict. Um, peace? I don't think so. I think if they wanted peace, uh, then they would be building up the economy and trying to make reparations for some of the damage they've done. But as soon as the, the deal is done with Saudi Arabia and Houthis, that will, they'll be, you know, in my opinion, there'll just be more conflict. Um, so I don't, I don't really think there's a desire for long-standing peace. And also the Houthis have very unrealistic demands too uh, and visions for Yemen. Um, I just wanted to linger slightly, if I may, on the Western versus non-Western powers concept if possible. So I think just I'd just like to talk about China and Russia quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, China and Russia have relationships with Saudi Arabia and Iran. 
um, as you as listeners may know, China have kind of brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran tentatively fairly recently. Yeah. So they, they're both balances and they're both kind of looking to find more influence where the US is waning in various different ways. But um, there's a scholar called Chiz- uh, Chiziza who sum- summarised the Chinese approach um, quite well in the early days. So Beijing refuses to condemn the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen and supports UN Resolution 2216 on Yemen, which bans arms sales to the Houthi fighters. On the other hand, China has called for a ceasefire and supports the UN Security Council playing a constructive role in resolving the conflict through political means. So another scholar, Chang, says that China was able to strike a balance between two rival powers by supporting the Saudis on Yemen on the one hand and the Iranians on the nuclear deal on the other. The Chinese calculated that Yemen was a higher priority for the Saudis than the Iranians and a nuclear deal was more significant to Tehran. Um, The other thing to say is that China has... Uh, in 2017, China announced its largest ever weapons export deal to Saudi Arabia. Um, so they provided the Saudis with, I think, 300 wing uh, drones and also are build, helping Saudis to build capacity to create their own drones. And to, that's, that's something that within Vision 2030, they want to be able to produce all their own drones, the Saudis. Um, yeah. So... One of my peers, actually, Benjamin Houghton, wrote that between 2012 and 2016, Sino-Saudi trade totaled between US $44 billion and US $73 billion annually, with oil representing the most commonly traded product. I won't go too much into Russia because I don't think their role has been as significant. Um, But they've they've just been balancing between the two, hedging their bets. Um, but I think they're really trying to get in with the Saudis after Biden has insulted them in various different ways. And so they play an important role too. And just just to imagine Yemen at the moment, I go to Yemen. What can I see? Like, can I travel to Yemen or the war is ongoing like in each part of the country? Because uh, I spoke with some students and they told me like, we always heard about war in Yemen. But we don't know where is the war. Is it like everywhere or or how is the reality if people come to Yemen? If you can clarify on that. I'm I'm very um I'm very like nervous about making comparisons. Um I don't think they're always very useful. I think it's like a fairly simplistic way to do it. But I suppose like in Syria in the peak of the war, there's lots of different types of fighting going on. So there's fighting between um, Assad and some of the oppositional forces, like the, the main opposition. And you've got fights against uh, Daesh. And then you've got like the Kurds and you've got uh, some more local battles going on between militia groups. And th- there is a the similarity in that sense with Yemen. There's, there's, it's not safe at the moment. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, uh, Aisha Juman, who's a Yemeni scholar, thinks that strangely enough Sana in the north where the Houthis are is actually one of the most safe places just because they they've kind of consolidated control um but you know a lot of the parts of the country there are sporadic conflicts but it's a lot better than it's been in years because of the ceasefire but things do crop up and because of the level of long-term deprivation there are there are still a lot of scrambles for resources going on as well. How do you see the interplay between politics and religion? Because you know, for instance, Afghanistan when Taliban you know came to power, there was a Sharia law in, imposing you know like strict rules on the society. So is Yemen a similar case, or the situation is different in Yemen? Look, I mean. Um, It's complex, is why I'm taking a while to talk about it. I think Fanar Haddad wrote a great book called Understanding Sectarianism, which I always point people towards, just because he says that there's different faces of sectarian identity, and they matter differently or more, depending on the context of the particular conflict or situation. So that I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but you know, there's the doctrinal realities of it, and they're sort of the transnational influence of different forces and there's also some sort of national instrumentalized i think the reason i never want to connect them too much is that um 
I think that the Houthis are primarily a domestic group with long-standing domestic grievances who've been radicalized, if you like, as a term, or militarized by six wars. Uh, and so there's no doubt that there are members of the Houthi establishment who are very devout in their Zaydi, Zaydism and want some kind of return to an imamate. However, however, that's not all of them. And they are very repressive when it comes to freedom of speech and other things. Um, but I think comparing them to the Taliban wouldn't be something I would I would do uh, straight away. I don't think it's quite the same thing. Um, I think as well, a lot, Saudi Arabia and Iran have spent a lot of time framing this as a sectarian conflict for their own narrow self-interests. It suits them to say that. So with Saudi Arabia, it suits them to say, the reason we're intervening in this war is because we're defending the Sunni world from an expansionist Shia aggressor. Equally, it suits Iran to say, we are defending our Shia ally from a, a, um, a malicious Sunni coalition who is seek to wipe out minorities from the Middle East. But neither of those things is entirely true. Let's talk about the humanitarian implications of the war. What do we have at the moment and how was it in the last, let's say, five years? Okay, so um, I'm going to take you through some of the core statistics. I think that's the best way. Okay. You know, the, the actual number that we sort of know, that we know of the official figure of people who've died is actually 377,000. Uh, that's the UN figure. Were many predicted it's, it's many more, but that was by the end of 2021, okay. um, since which there's not been as much in the way of fighting. Um, but, you know, the blockade wasn't lifted for a while. Um, for most of the conflict, so by June, so the conflict started in March of 2015, by June and then onwards up until, gosh, 2021, 2022, 80% of the population were dependent on humanitarian aid. But wasn't reaching them okay so a huge number of those casualties died as a direct result of of the blockade which saudi arabia imposed stopping what they said stopping iranian weapons getting in but actually stopping food humanitarian aid reaching the country uh, human human rights watch and medicine and some frontier concurred with the un in arguing that the saudi blockade was the primary cause of the crisis uh, the humanitarian crisis. So another statistic, about um, about 90% of Yemen's basic food intake came from imports um, prior to the war, and that went down to around 15% by June 2015. Um, the other thing about it is that um, Yemen doesn't have, like, it's really not got any water, so it relies a lot on water imports and other forms of like it's a lot of contaminated water all of a sudden um, was being depended upon and that resulted in a cholera outbreak as well as diphtheria which have wiped out a lot of people and COVID-19 too um, so um, yeah I just want to read you this one thing so um, data from the Yemen Data Project recorded 843 Saudi airstrikes in March to April 2015. So these are in the very most intense periods of the Operation Decisive Storm. Of these airstrikes, 281 were on non military targets. They showed that at least um, 3,876 Yemeni civilians were killed by Saudi airstrikes and a further 4,521 uh, 4, were injured. Um, but they don't do significant justice to the impact of those strikes. So a strike in October 2015, slightly later on, it hit hospital in Sada. It didn't kill any civilians immediately, but it left 200,000 people without any health care. I see. This is the nature. And uh, I could I haven't got the figures in front of me for how many hospitals and schools they've hit, for example, or healthcare facilities, but it's a lot. Okay. And where we're at now is... The economy is completely destroyed. People are still struggling to get aid. 
and these continue and continue and continue. Tom, you mentioned two two things. First, blockade, and then yeah. humanitarian aid as a as a main source of surviving, basically for people in Yemen. So let's explain blockade. What does it mean, and how mm-hmm. does it work in practice? And the second question: the humanitarian aid coming to Yemen from which countries, or how is it organized? Yeah. So a blockade um, is a Basic, basically, it's where you put your your navy in place, or to stop boats reaching ports, and you and you just completely cut off supply to certain ports, uh, and that you have to give a stated reason for that, um, which Saudi Arabia obviously have said is because Iranian weapons are coming in through those ports. Yeah. Okay. So that's what a blockade is. Um, we can talk. I know there's potentially a question later about um, international law and how to navigate them. But um, in terms of what, in terms of humanitarian aid, a lot of people have been giving, trying to give aid to Yemen. Um, so a lot of the groups I've sort of mentioned, human rights groups, organisations, these kinds of things, um, but state actors too. Interestingly enough, Saudi Arabia which it never stops talking about, is the biggest state donor of humanitarian aid to Yemen. They set up a specific unit for this called the King Salman Centre for Humanitarian Aid and Relief. However, the amount it's donated uh, in aid is uh, less than 0.5% of its total expenditure on military investment into the war. Uh, So it's kind of like... um, it's a very humanitarian aid is politicized to to make Saudi Arabia look better than it is. Let's touch that international law straight mm-hmm. away because I think hundred percent of of my students would be jumping to this uh, topic uh, straight away or immediately. Yeah. I mean, we have co- we had conflict in Kosovo now, Gaza and and Ukraine and Nagorno Karabakh, and in some way the world was always able to get the humanitarian aid to these territories. But you said that Yemen is quite different. So Mm -hmm. does it mean that there is no international law applying to Yemen or or how is it, you know? Because like I I was thinking myself, if I am in charge of the UN or European Union, I can send planes. I don't need to go through the through the seaport. Or or how because you know this is something you know I'm I'm not able to grab hundred percent when it comes to international law because as as people say you know even war has some rules i am um, i've got to be careful when i talk about these things because you know sometimes in academia people get criticized for being for sounding like they're becoming polemical or opinionated so i, I always take a breath when i've asked these questions um but i i, I take issue with people criticizing me for, for for being passionate about this because I challenge them to look at some of the images and some of the context and some of the statistics that I have and and the, the horrific lived experiences and and not to be you know the thing I want to say is that the world willfully does not care about Yemen and has not cared about Yemen throughout the whole of the conflict because if it did it wouldn't have backed the coalition that has done so much damage. Um, and they have. So the, the, I'm going to start with the UN and then I'll move on. There's, there's no, there was no prior fiat from the UN. They, the Saudi Arabia didn't receive any previous, you know, you can do this from the UN, which is a dangerous precedent in itself, right? But the UN did refuse to condemn them. And issued a statement about a month after the intervention, just condemning the Houthis and not condemning Saudi Arabia. So you didn't go as far as backing Saudi Arabia, but they didn't condemn them. Uh, Adel Al Jabir, who was the U, uh, the US, he was the ambassador to the US at the time of the intervention. He actually announced the intervention to the world in Washington, and then Washington parroted the exact same narrative about why that war was happening and the justification for it on the same day. Um, so 
in terms of international law, um, there's a concept known as intervention by invitation, which sometimes is justified. So if like if someone's being invaded and they invite you, that sometimes works. This is a civil war though. So that doesn't really apply in the same way with a civil war. Um, except there is a precedent that was set with one of the Cold War interventions of the US that if you can prove there's a significant involvement of a proxy from the outside, then you can. So that's why Saudi Arabia have exaggerated it, the Iranian involvement narrative so much. But also they keep hammering home the point of we have always and we are defending the legitimate government. The legitimate government of President Hadi, who stood in a single candidate election for a process after a peace process controlled by the Gulf Corporation Council in Saudi Arabia. And after, you know, he 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 was he was appointed short term, elected in a single candidate election prior to that process. And then after the process, the process concluded he should stay. OK, so there's a great paper written by this called Wearing the Storm by Rusin Rusinan. Pharaoh. And they write, given that President Hadi and his government were engaged in a non-international armed conflict with the Houthi rebels and lacked effective control over significant parts of the territory at the moment the letter was sent, it can be questioned whether they still have that legitimate authority. And so, you know, it's a fickle barometer legally. It doesn't really work. Um, in terms of the blockade, the blockade, in my opinion, is illegal. It's really hard when it comes to the laws of the sea and the thing is is the technicality of it that means that it's not viewed in that way is that technically these policies are done by Hadi and not by Saudi Arabia so that he's doing this and there's there's more room for maneuver there there's more wiggle room but there's this article I found, um, this, this legal document I found, this is called the San Remo Manual, and it covers the laws of the sea. Section 102 of that says that um, a blockade is unjustified if the damage to the civilian population was excessive into relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated from the blockade, which, I mean, that that's the definition of what happened. And um, the Red Cross, in terms of proportionality, says that uh, launching an attack which may be expected to cause incidental loss of life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated, is prohibited. The reason Saudi Arabia have got away with all of this is because of their importance to the international Western economy. Not just Western economy, China and Russia too. That's my argument. Right. That was that's quite interesting to listen because even if you are not international lawyer, you can feel something fishy, you know. So yeah. so 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 that that was very good that you also read, you know, those those uh, quotations from the sources so from the sources, so so people can verify and can get back to them, you know, anytime. Yeah. And Tom, uh, when we had those human that humanitarian crisis in Yemen ongoing war and everything all together as in one boiling kettle or pot. How is this influencing tribes that you mentioned at the beginning? Because mm -hmm. we were speaking about Houthis, but you said, you know, that the population is quite diverse. So let's say when we have smaller tribes, what are their reaction to what's going on in Yemen? And mm -hmm. do they have any instruments or any communication channels how to s express their opinions or it's all suppressed by by houthis well it's important to say that the houthis only have control over part of the country it is the most densely populated part of the country but there's, okay. a huge, there's a huge part of the country which is under different forms of control um i think uh, from what i hear from yemeni friends most, a, a lot of Yemenis' primary anger is directed at Saudi Arabia. So that's one thing that connects most of them, but it's probably the only thing. Um, I think what the war has done is it's not only entrenched many tribal loyalties and divisions, it's also sort of created new divisions based on 
crimes committed by various factions against others and um also um i think it it's embedded some more some new types of identity as well in terms of communication you know getting onto social media in parts of yemen is it's done it's uh, it can be done and so social media is a way in which people communicate and organize there are thankfully some really positive women's groups grassroots movements bottom up trying to make a difference but they are up against something really challenging and i think oh, again i don't like making comparisons but in a lot of these states as they exist in the global south uh, in africa and middle east and other places they shouldn't really exist in the way that they do because the people within them have their really own sense of idea of what they want out of their society it's not so much an ethnic thing or a religious thing it's a it's a cultural historical thing and uh, you know i think the most realistic that such is the damage now after eight years of war um that the only realistic sustainable peace option would be to allow those tribal loyalties to to, to, to flourish in a, in a more natural state solution, which would be many more states than one. Tom, some people and some students might ask, uh, when we had war in Syria and in more countries, there were refugees. Is it possible to escape from Yemen? And do we have any refugees coming from Yemen? There are, there are, there are, there are refugees from Yemen and in, in various different countries. Um, mainly in the Middle East. So you've got a lot of Yemenis in Egypt, in North Africa, and um, you've got some in Oman, you've got some in other parts too, but it's much harder to get out of Yemen. And obviously with the blockade on the West Coast, to get past that that blockade would, would, would be a real challenge. Um, so that's why you don't see as many. And um, But equally, I don't think that alone explains why people aren't as aware of it as some of the other conflicts. I think there's more to it than just that. I see. Because I think that's that's quite a good uh, geopolitical aspect of Yemen, that, mm. you know, it's not easy to escape, as you said. You know, it's, it's not like, oh, just going away and the war can continue in Yemen. So that, that makes things complicated and complex, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, um, let's, the other thing... Uh, please. The other thing to say just briefly as well is that the blockade included airports as well. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So that, that was another route taken away from people. That's that's quite an important fact, you know, because you you block the airway, you block the land, you block the sea. So how can you escape? That's the question. Yes, and it reminds there are other situations in the world where that is a similar situation for people, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's touch a little bit terrorism. Um, some people might be skeptical. Some people might be interested in how fighters in Yemen collaborate or not collaborate with terrorists. Do we have any terrorists in Yemen? Let's explain this. There, there have. I mean, the Charlie, the Charlie Hebdo murders were actually done by. Uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, who are based in Yemen, um, that that the U.S. has long regarded AQAP as their known or ACAP as the the most dangerous wing of Al Qaeda. So they are stronger than they've ever been at the moment in Yemen, central parts of Yemen. Um, they, the, like any terrorist group, they benefit hugely when there's huge amounts of deprivation and young dispossessed men. And Yemen's rife, yeah. Um, so they are quite bold and quite strong. I think one of the reasons why Hadi did so well and why he was extended um, before, obviously, he was ousted, was because he allowed the US to conduct one of their largest counterterrorism operations in southern and central parts of Yemen between 2012 and 2014. They thought they made a dent, but actually, you know, you know with terrorism, these things come back around. Uh, Daesh were also active in Yemen. 
um, at points. Um, I think with terrorism, though, it's, it's, it, it, there are many groups you could define as a terrorist in this, in this conflict, but it, it all depends on perspective and opinion. Um, and, um, you know, Saudi Arabia refers to the Houthis as terrorists. I'm sure the Houthis refer to Saudi Arabia as terrorists. I, you know, the, the, the separatists in the South get referred to in that way. There's uh, Isla as well, another party involved. Um, so, you know, you could say, well, if the Houthis are a terrorist, well, Iran is connected to them. Or you could say, well, if the separatists are terrorists, then the UAE is sponsoring them. Or you could say, well, if the Saudi, if Saudi Arabia are terrorists, then the US is supporting them. Do you know what I mean? The ones we all can agree on, I suppose, are Al-Qaeda and, and Daesh. And as you know, Daesh are not a big deal anymore in the way they were al-qaeda is very much so and that's that's what's really dangerous to the rest of the world and why based on their own rational interest they would do better to pay attention to Yemen. that's quite interesting to hear because uh i think with the hamas and israel at the moment the terrorism is getting attention yes so so i think this will come to yemen shortly as well Mm-hmm. Um, because it is how it is, and and we don't know how the war in in uh, Gaza in in with Hamas and Israel will develop. Because uh, this might go to regional war, this might go to something bigger. <laughs> Depends what sort of players and actors will get involved. But I wanted to ask you one question, which which I was always thinking about: Does Yemen have any friends? in geopolitics and internationally like for instance uh, you have like states and also you have the international organizations so is there someone who is trying to support yemen yeah i mean i think the thing the issue we've got is that there's two yemen's isn't there there's at least two there's the there's the government which had he ceded power presidential ruling council thing who um are largely based in other countries or in parts of the country that are safe from the Houthis. And then you've also got the Houthis. Um, that's a simplification. There are many more. But I think in terms of let's focus on Yemenis and who's trying to actually help the Yemeni people as a whole. I'm struggling. I think, you know, there are organizations, but I think they're charities. I think they're human rights organizations. I think they're humanitarian groups. There's a lot of that one one of my colleagues is writing a book at the moment about accountability in Yemen. And I think that's going to be really interesting. I think the UN have made some efforts, um, but they've been largely unsuccessful. So, I mean, in terms of countries who are really just trying to help the people of Yemen, I don't think there are any, really. Let's go to academia for a moment. And what do you think about the broader implications of this war to academia, to the research? And and how do you see this conflict in Yemen as a topic for researchers in academia? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say on this one, I think. Um, I think the thing I was talking about earlier, the principle of a non-democratic state, Saudi Arabia, getting away with a war, not only getting away with a war, but really flourishing as a country off the back of it. Like, they're going to host the World Cup probably in 2034. Um, Saudi Arabia are completely locked into the international system in a way they've never been but, but prior uh, to this extent. And um, that in itself is significant. So I think we're going to see more states who are non-democratic getting away with wars, and it's set a really dangerous precedent. And I think that's important within the field. I think the way in which visual, visual propaganda has been used in on but on all sides is really significant for IR. I think we need to do more to consider the power of the visual, especially you know visceral images of death and dying within conflict. Uh, there's a great book called Sensible Politics about this that's worth a read. Um, also, the the way in which humanitarian aid has been politically used to justify and cloud and wash war crimes is really significant. Um, I also think the 
the double standards of ethical condemnation of conflict really play out in Yemen. So when Russia invades Ukraine, quite rightly, the international community is vocally outraged. But this conflict goes on in Yemen for eight years and 400,000 people die and no one even talks about it. And the US are complicit in this. And this is all, this is just a huge dynamic that needs unpacking how this is allowed to happen. And it really is reminiscent of Cold War, by the way. Uh, I also think something very important needs to be said about the, the racialized approach that people have to suffering. So, yeah. Do do you have any colleagues, like I mean, Yemenis who are academics, for instance, living abroad and who are trying to, you know, write about it and and get some insights about it, this war, or or how how is that Yemeni community in terms of academics or academia? There's some there's some there's some brilliant Yemeni um, scholars around. Um, some who I I work with. In, have worked with at Durham and I've been on panels with and they they are doing some incredible work at understanding the causes of this conflict and how to how to change them. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of PhDs in particular that I'm work, I've worked with have been are really making a huge difference. I think the thing is though is connecting those findings to real policy and implementation. Um, which is a further step and something that needs to happen really immediately. Um, but look, I mean, th- there's only so much we as academics can do, I feel. Um, raising awareness is the thing that I try and do. And, uh, you know, hopefully that has some, that that just makes people aware of what's happening. Because I just, I just didn't think no one knows. So for instance, um, I live in the Northeast of England Newcastle United Football Club is owned by the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. And Newcastle United fans love them because they've saved their football club. They don't know about Yemen. Why would they know about Yemen? Media doesn't report about Yemen. No one knows about Yemen. And even when the accusations made, oh, your owners are immoral or whatever, they talk about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, you know, a Western-based Saudi journalist, not 400,000 people who've been killed. In, uh, in Yemen, so understood. Yeah. Understood. It's a it's a big issue, as we say, you know, with the with the complex implications. But I'm interested in one one thing. Uh, you are researching sort of visual propaganda. How is this an Yemen? Like, uh, how can we connect visual propaganda and Yemen, or can we? Yes. So. Absolutely. So um, there have been a lot in terms of the external actors, in terms of Saudi Arabia and Iran, they've both used visual propaganda on social media and on the, you know, on their news platforms to characterize and constitute the other against which all actions are justified is my essential argument. So the Iranians use a lot of cartoons and caricatures, actually, that they've that they make. I've, I've written about this. Um, and plan to write more about it. Saudi Arabia actually created this video game style video where called Saudi Strike Force, where it showed them invading Iran and then sending aid ships to Yemen, which the Iranians destroyed. And it's all, it's visuality is crucial, but also like the, the Iranians show a lot of images of dead and death and dying and suffering to show some of the horrors of the Saudis, but also they they exaggerate and connect. And there's a lot of anti-Semitism and other things in there connecting it to a Jewish plot. And the Houthis use visual propaganda to, to show solidarity, success. They're like they, they beat the Saudi, led they, they beat the coalition forces in this one battle and they broadcast it on television showing the humiliated troops. And it's a big part I think we 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 are very problematic in IR that we don't look at visuality enough. We assume that it's all about words and discourse and policy. Actually, the visual representation of things is as important, in my opinion. 
especially when I believe the figure is around between 70 and 80 percent of all content on the media is video. And and when we mentioned social media in Yemen, uh, I wanted to ask about the internet because internet is super important. We mm. see this in Gaza as well at the moment. You know how they switch off the internet connection, and people basically lost the communication channels. So, mm. for instance, if someone is researching Yemen, there is a junior researcher, senior researcher, doesn't matter. Can we connect to Yemen via social media, or is it restricted? No, we can. We do. So, like I've been on panels uh, and and discussions with people coming in via the internet. Of course, you, depending on where you are in the country, you've got to be careful because there is. It's it's not the same as Iran, for instance, where in Iran you you're playing with absolute fire all the time and actually they're trying to outlaw social media entirely uh, it's not it's not the same as that in yemen but they the internet connection is terrible in yemen so often uh, it's a very slow process but that's more to do with the level of development in parts of the country the last question for today's interview tom uh, this is super complex topic and there are super complex issues when it comes to Yemen. But despite that, what recommendations would you offer or would you suggest to policymakers to address this crisis? Yeah, so there's a few. I think um, one of the key things that's gone wrong with all UN and Western approaches is they've not really listened to the people on the ground and got a diversity of opinion. So I think they need to do that. They need to really understand Yemen properly in all of its places and forms and work towards what people on the ground actually want. Like the previous peace processes have all been about elites and they don't represent the people in Yemen, none of them. Uh, and that might be a different setup. There's such an obsession within the UN and within international politics on keeping states as they are. Yemen shouldn't exist as the state that it is. It should exist as many more, maybe five or six. So that would be something to consider. I'd say get that out of your head that you need to keep Yemen as one unit. I don't think that's necessarily for the best. Stop listening to Saudi Arabia all the time as well, because it, it has such narrow, constricted, rational interests in Yemen. And it sees itself as custodians of the country almost. And it's, it's only ever going to want to keep them weak and keep them pliant. I think also taking a longer view of counterterrorism would be important that in order to stop these things like Al Qaeda, you need to have proper security. And in order to have proper security, you have to rebuild the economy um, and actually build up the country again, which is not what's happening. And also, I think um, there needs to be some accountability for the war crimes that have happened in this. Because, I mean, I've looked at the human rights watch reports is reports where they they go to a, a site and they're, they're us and uk bombs that have been dropped on schools and hospitals and markets and they've, and they've been dropped by saudi arabia and nothing happens nothing happens and so there needs to be accountability and there needs to be some form of reparations um the other thing is just not accepting uh humanitarian aid as evidence that someone is sacrosanct it, there's a bigger picture and giving the country some aid doesn't excuse you from your actions and your accountability in the conflict so yeah those would be my my key points tom thank you very much for your time and for your insightful remarks about yemen i know it's complicated and it's a quite sensitive topic as well but especially nowadays when we have more conflicts ongoing in different parts of the world Ukraine, Israel, Armenia, Azerbaijan, some in Africa as well. Mm. I think Yemen deserves the attention of international community. And I, I'm very happy that we could contribute to this uh, gap. And uh, I wish you all the best for your research because it's, it's super complex, complicated and time consuming as well. But also I think the international community should do something about Yemen 
unless we want to keep it as frozen, forgotten, maybe unnoticed conflict going somewhere in the world. Tom, thank you again for your words and we'll include all the recommendations for the readings that you stated in the YouTube description and also links to your work so our viewers can go, can read about your work and also some junior researchers who are interested in researching Yemen can contact you and perhaps you will produce some good papers. Thank you again, Tom. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for having me. See you next time. Thank you.